Oh, happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to my show where it really is okay to not be okay. I'm Ray Bonney, a qualified counsellor, workplace mental health specialist, and not to mention a very dedicated and often time enthusiastically disruptive men's issues advocate. Not every girl's dream job, but hey, remember, men also matter. As it happens, my, my show usually falls on a significant event, and the last one being Mother's Day. I guess today we can celebrate being safe and well in the first week of our second lockdown here in Melbourne. Anyway, as always on my show, I'm unwrapping one of the greatest gifts going around and that is people. Layer by layer, we explore the thoughts, experiences, achievements and challenges of ordinary people bound to inspire the best you. So turn up your radio. The time is just 32 minutes past 10. We just heard from the beautiful and talented Michelle Cicado present her very popular Italian program, Fantastica Michelle. Uh, now, my guest today has quite a story to tell about his experience of trauma and how a verbatim theatre can play a starring role in leading to post-trauma growth. Sometime in the 1980s, Darren Wagner began his love of theatre in San Jose, California, which led to a short-lived career treading the boards. As it happened, Darren was not destined to be a Broadway actor and reimagined his life to become a deputy sheriff at Clark County, Ohio, during the 1990s. The next time Darren stepped onto the world stage was during 2012, when the community of his new hometown of Sandy Hook, Connecticut, experienced a school shooting that became one of America's most deadliest massacres. Hear what it feels like being Darren back then and what it feels like today, including his involvement with 26 Pebbles, which is a verbatim play uh, about the members in Sandy Hook community and how they experienced the tragedy and built strength of community, courage and compassion. Darren is joining us over the phone all the way from Sydney, Australia. Welcome to the show, Darren. Good morning, Ray, and good morning, everyone. Oh, everyone said good morning. The texts are flying in. Good morning, Darren. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> a shame you can't be in the studio with us today. Uh, here in Melbourne, we are um, in isolation again. So that social distancing is very, very important. Absolutely. Now, you're living uh, with your family in Sydney, working as a peer support manager, educator, lived experienced researcher, counsellor, post-traumatic growth advocate. Like, Tell me what you do in your spare time. <laughs> I'm always looking for another hat for the hat rack. Always looking for another hat. Um, no, it's you know, you know, my, my spare time is is always my passion. Um, so um, you know, it's there's not a lot of spare time, but when I when I do any of my work, it's uh, it's, it's heartfelt um, and, and it's always evolving. Yes. Mm. Now you have uh, expensive, oh, expensive. Well, you have expensive taste, uh, but you have extensive experience working with mass trauma um, after supporting your community at Sandy Hook in the United States when the elementary school tra tragedy occurred uh, on December 14, 2012. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, you know, so, some, some opportunities you wish didn't come your way and, um, you know, kind of sliding door moments that, you know, I, I wish that that train would have passed me by, but, um, mm. you know, it, 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 it's... Yeah, as yourself and most of our listeners know that you know, you know, often these things just pop up and uh, we're, we're dealt uh, you know, a blow. But it's, it's how do we overcome it, uh, adapt to it, and, and you know, hopefully grow. And that's you know, that's why I, I loved uh, the idea around uh, having a talk with you today about uh, post-traumatic growth. Yes, well, that is the basis of the show. Not wanting to dwell, you know, too too much uh, on the tragedy, which has you know, most people will remember it being very, very widely. Um, you know, um, promoted in the media and, uh, you know, even here in Australia, we've had our own uh, tragedies around gun uh, deaths and, you know, we're very grateful that, you know, uh, one of our Prime Ministers, John Howard, you know, back in 96 after uh, Port Arthur was able to mm -hmm. um, implement some really good uh, gun reforms and we haven't fortunately seen anything like that since. So thank you, John Howard. Yes. <laughs> no. Absolutely. Uh, and, and we we definitely won't delve into politics. And I, no. I could actually get up on. <laughs> I will get up. I could get up onto my soapbox and talk or ramble for hours on that topic. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, around around um, you know sensible what is sensible gun legislation yes. and what can we do better. Um, but yes. No. We won't go there. 
<laughs> well, we do have an hour and a half to spend together and I'm sure we're going to fill that in very, very easily. And how we met, I was introduced to you by the general manager, Julia Edwards, at Entertainment Assist and I work there with Julia as the program manager and we're the, health, uh, the national health promotion charity that supports the mental health and well-being of the Australian entertainment industry, which is in dire need. Um, of support at the moment and I was introduced to you as a person of interest around your, your specialisation in uh, post-traumatic stress and also vicarious trauma which is something that's experienced more often not than not within the entertainment industry. No, absolutely, uh, and I think it's uh, it's that vicarious trauma that, that you know yourself and you know, I'm sure most of your uh, viewers uh, and especially living in this uh, you know COVID, um, you know, 2020, I, I think uh, vicarious trauma is, you know, as we all go forward, you know, I think just mentioning the word 2020 or, or even toilet paper, um, yes. we'll all have a shared, ex a shared experience um, around vicarious trauma. Yes, and I think also as we move into, you know, more stages of COVID, uh, you, even here in Melbourne, having a second lockdown, it's just a new kind of trauma for people where it's almost re-traumatising the original one. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's it's important that you know that we honour that that it, you know that it is a trauma. Um, often we you know when I talk around trauma and people know of my story and they they'll say, look, you know, you know, I really have nothing to complain about. It wasn't as big as that. It was, and often I will correct it really quickly. Look, at you know, trauma is trauma, yes. um, and and it's how it's perceived and how it's felt. So you know, this event uh, has definitely built us each our own little traumas. Mm. I, I like that you said that, you know, when your cup is full, it's full, because we, we do tend to compare, and even, you know, your experience at Sandy Hook, uh, you know, 20, 27 people died that day, is that correct? So 20, 28 in total, so, yeah, mm. interesting, so, the, yeah, there, there's a, you know, a, the 26 pebbles, which we'll talk about, so that, yes. that number became, you know, the, the actual victims of the day, but, you know, it was also the shooter um, and his mother. So we, we actually had 28 people that day. Yes. And, you know, one might say, well, that's the ultimate um, tragedy. And, you know, how that reverberated, not only through that community there, but throughout the world, especially because many children were victims, uh, was something yeah. that, you know, there's a lot of vicarious trauma happening. And I'm keen to uh, hear about your insights on how the community got together and what kinds of things that they did that helped um, manage as best they could through such adversity. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it was, I think that was the, the that was the, the shock um, after the initial shock wears off, which was, you know, the first couple of days was, uh, you know, very numbing. It was a very, very numbing. And uh, I, I can barely recall, you know, once I knew that my, my two sons were safe, um, the, the next few days were just, just really a blur. Um, but as, as each week and month went on, it was amazing to see how it had impacted the world. And we started receiving cards and gifts from Tibetan monks, ch children's schools in the Tibetan monk uh, mm. communities, and uh, um, just this worldwide um, you know, compassion. Um, I, didn't, I didn't pay for coffee for, I think, the, the next year. Uh. We had a, an anonymous donors. We had one small little coffee shop um, right, right just down from the firehouse in the school, uh, and people found it somehow and donated so much money that every time I went, it's like, no, it's still covered, it's still covered. Um, so yeah, a lot of compassion. Yeah, yeah and, and when nobody really knows what to do, it's sort of similar to what where we're at at the moment is this is something unprecedented and we don't have the resilience or the knowledge to know exactly what to do but then when we trust our gut and the, the human spirit it's amazing how powerful that can be oh yeah no the, 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 the power the resiliency of people because often they'll say you know how brave and what you know and, and no we're all faced with things and you don't know until you get into that um situation um and we all face them so we we all have those losses and grief and, and as we say you know the, the COVID is definitely a loss of freedom um, you know, it's an unknown, and you know, we, as humans, we really don't don't like that. We don't sit well with that that unknown, mm. um, and with with it being a virus that it, that's unseeable. So you know, it, it makes it even more scary. Yes, that's right. You know, it, I was just thinking now about our first. We had a Zoom catch up first, so we got to see <laughs> each other. It's a new way. <laughs> Anyone experiencing yeah. Zoomeek? <laughs> that's the thing that happens when you've had eight Zoom meetings in a row. Uh, but 
we spoke about lots of things, including the work that you're currently doing as a, a peer support manager at uh, New South Wales Health, where you take care of a team that supports uh, mental health inpatient units and also community mental health services. And you're right up there at the coal face because I think you were going in to um, give some uh, drama therapy or something like that to <laughs> a group. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it, it's interesting. You know, we'll, we'll obviously, you know, talk about my love of passion uh, and uh, around theatre. Um, but it's it's interesting when you can pull those little threads of your previous lives um, back into something meaningful. So that yeah, you know, being in the coal face is definitely um, you know that that front line. But being able to utilize so for those people that you know that you know maybe have never heard of the word uh, peer support worker or maybe a little un unsure of what it is is. In fact, the peer workers are people with a lived experience, um, and we all have a lived experience, um, but what we do in peer, peer workers will often utilize their own lived experience. So what we call purposeful storytelling, so they'll use their own experiences, you know, not so much about the what happened to them, but what did I learn from it? Mm -hmm. So what came out of that, and how then can I support other people? Uh, my job is then to support them in supporting other people. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the, the drama program came up because we actually, people were being isolated, and I thought, well, uh, drama and arts, I know as a fact, um, have a way of, have a healing benefit. So I ran it past the, uh, the, the consumers on the mental health units, and they thought it was a great idea. So we, we did eight weeks of drama um, looking at uh, Louis Nara's Cosi, um, which is, uh, for those that, that aren't aware of the play, actually deals with uh, mental health um, uh, it's actually an asylum back then, um, an Australian asylum. Um, when I first came to Australia, I, I thought uh, Australia was such an amazing country that built these lovely sandstone asylums yeah. um, next to next to the water, next to the water yes. because they, they wanted the patients to have some water therapy. Well, you know, hi historically, back when they were built, we uh, mental health patients or uh, lunatics, as they were called back mm. then, uh, weren't allowed to travel on the King's Highway, so they were shipped in um, along the water and brought into the asylum. So we explored, we explored that history and language, um, and it was extremely successful, mm. really successful. No, it's, 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 it's great work, and as you and I know, there is so much to be done in the mental health space. You know, we, we haven't really scratched the surface yet, and there are so many great no. things that are happening and things that probably are still quite detrimental uh, to us moving forward. Uh, yeah. But I did. I just. I just had a uh, a text message from a friend of mine, Mark, and he is. Uh, he's also an ex copper, and uh -huh. very much at the front line and lives with pretty chronic post traumatic stress. And he said, you know, he's listening in at the moment. Hello, Mark. <laughs> uh, and he said, Hi, I wish, Mark. <laughs> he said, I wish I had that kind of support. I had nil and none faced with weapon wielding. Um, I won't say what he said there, but weapon-wielding right. people um, multiple times, nil support, and rejection is the hardest to deal with. Um, oh, and then, yeah, and, yeah th thanks for that, Mark. Uh, and that's not uncommon. So it, it feels uncommon, so when that happens to you, you often feel cut off from your, your profession. Who are you? Um, and often, you know, we, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, 30 years ago when I first uh, developed PTS and, and, you know, you know, I won't use the word PTSD except this one and only time. Um, <laughs> only because people post, post, relate to it. <laughs> <laughs> Post-traumatic stress disorder. So we, there's, you know, again, language and mental health is evolving. So yes. the D in disorder we drop. So post-traumatic stress for the rest of the program. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, Mark, you're, you're right. Um, often you feel isolated, um, ashamed, um, you lose that sense of purpose. Um, we're getting better at it. So when I went through the police academy for six months, we, we actually didn't have one component of mental health training. Um, however, whenever there was a mental health issue in the community of any significance, we were the first ones called uh, with triple zero, so actually 911. Mm. <laughs> yeah, ill-prepared. But uh, before we go to a break, it comes up fast, doesn't it? Uh, oh, wow, yeah. We, I mentioned in the intro that your early years, you're pretty dedicated to uh, um, becoming an actor or a live theatre performer. <laughs> And you went, you know, you went and studied, and you got some roles, and then realised that it probably wasn't going to be a sustainable career. What then segued you to the police force? <laughs> <laughs> good, very, very good question. How do, how do you go from being a, an actor from that role into? Um, um, and and it, it looked happened. My, my my parents had divorced, and I wound up back in Ohio. 
yep. as, a, as a young actor. And the uh, acting opportunities out in rural Ohio weren't vast. Um, so uh, I had always been a you know kind of a first aid instructor and been involved in that kind of stuff and a friend of mine said hey we've got a volunteer fire department so i went from volunteer fireman to uh paramedic um into into law enforcement um so it, it was a it was a very unusual transition but it was always kind of in support of people um, yeah. so it, it, you know it's just been u- utilizing different tools along the way was it also a case of, oh, the money's good and you know, a bit of superannuation? Oh, you probably don't have superannuation over there. But. Well, look, yeah, no, yeah, and again, that gets back to America. Again, look, you know, that, that, that would have, that, that has an impact on why we choose a career. You know, it, it actually had a good health insurance policies. Um, it's a good career. It's respectable. So, you know, you, you, you feel like, you know, when you come home, you've, you've done something um, that, that's hopefully helped somebody along the way mm. um, and, 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 you know, and, and it, you just feel good at the end of the day coming home and it, uh, it's, it's challenging every day is different um, and, yeah. and I think I think I like that aspect of it that it, you know it's every day I just I just show up but not when it's that continuous trauma over and over again and you know knocking on yeah. people's doors studying that sentence you know um, why are we here why are we here? And, and 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 at the time, because we didn't have any mental health training or awareness, you, you don't realize. Because often people will say, "Well, you know, if they get me to the side, they'll say, so what was that one thing that broke you?'" Mm. And I have to reflect and go, "Well, you know, really, I honestly don't know. It, it wasn't one thing. It was accumulative. Mm. So it was, it was a lot of those little door knocking, a lot of those little scenes, a lot of those little um, incidents that, that just mm. built, you know the toxicity level builds up to a level that one day you just I, I went to put on my gun belt and I just went, I have no right to do this. Um, I'd been having memory issues and um, flashbacks. Couldn't remember what I did yesterday, but you know, 10 years ago, a scene would pop up with uh, smells and uh, images. And, and so I thought, well, you know, it's probably a good time to go see a doctor. Yeah. And that's when I got that lovely diagnosis. And <laughs> that usually is, is, is an ending of your career pretty quickly, which it was. You're seen as a broken you know, instrument. Mm. And um, you're, you're replaced very quickly. Yeah. But the fact is you are broken, but there's no one to help you put the pieces no, back together no. again. And I guess that's what Mark was saying before as well. It's Absolutely, just, yeah. Um, but we, we are going to go to a break. And when we come back, I'd love for you to, you know, tell us your story, um, you know, with the context of, you know, the, the trauma. And then when, because in fact, for listeners, when um, Darren did come back to the US. That's when the incident incident occurred at Sandy Hook, and he was no longer um, a, pol- a police officer then. So it must have had quite a different impact for you as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's different to be you know so I, you know to to be a civilian and have it impact your own family and being on the receiving end of that. Um, yeah, was, was was definitely a different experience. Yes. So um, on a, on a happier note. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, and we we and we will continue to get happier. As uh, I promise, that that was about as that's about as dark as it. <laughs> well, it, there's no avoiding it really in the mental health space. No. But you, to have that no. positive spin on things that, you know, whilst not sugarcoating it to say everything's going to be okay and you're going no. to recover, uh, rather than um, maybe being realistic to say, you know, how do we manage better with what we've got. How do we manage that? And as you said at the, at the start of the show, you know, it's okay to not be okay. Yep, it sure is. So now is the time that we start rolling out the special guest song request. So, <laughs> and that's you today, <laughs> Darren. So That's th- me, okay. <laughs> so the, fir- the first song we've got is a song called Bad Boys, and it's a 1987 song by the Jamaican reggae band Inner Circle. Um, yes. It was pretty popular back in its day, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Look, it 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 it, it had a, as a single, um, you know, I, it, it off of uh, their album. It, it didn't didn't do so well, and then eventually it was it caught the uh, eye or ear, I should say, of the producers of the, the American television show Cops. Yeah. Um, and became that iconic introduction, um, and. Uh, that ran up until this year. So I think Cops was just canceled with all of the political um, stuff that's going on in America. That show just canceled this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I actually happened to be on one of the introductions of uh, one season, myself and my dog. 
Oh. You could actually see my, my my dog was jumping through the window, and and and, and it looked very dramatic. But it was actually the, the the film crew were very bored one um, one weekend down in North Carolina when I was training, and they came down and filmed us training the dogs leaping through windows. Oh. Uh, but it looked dramatic. So that was just music. It actually okay. can you, can you uh, reference the episode? <laughs> should somebody wish to look it up? I, I don't know. It, it could be on YouTube, but that I, I've never looked it up again because they, they, they would change. Every time they would visit a new police department, they would use new footage um, for that introduction. Yeah. And so I, I couldn't, um, but if someone happens to come across it, <laughs> I guess I, I don't know if I would want to see it again, but no. It's, so it's, so it's I guess the significance no, but... <laughs> of this song has something to do with you being uh, a deputy sheriff? Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll start. We'll start with law enforcement, police, and bad boys. All right, then, don't go away, everyone. You're listening to ninety four point one FM. It's three WBC, and you're with Ray Bonnie. Don't go away. Oh, welcome back. The time is just. 56 minutes past 10 and you're listening to 94.1 FM it's 3WBC with Ray Bonney and Darren Wagner amongst many things he's a peer support manager, traumatic growth um, specialist and from what I hear also a bit of a clown Darren <laughs> uh, Yes uh, uh, just a, a little bit um. You would get to the funny stuff fast? Sure Sure. Well, that's, would you like to start with funny? <laughs> well, I, I did wake up very early this morning to put the uh, final touches on the show and you'd sent me a clip to a little bit of a skit around uh, clowns. Um, clowns in Was it clowns in recovery or...? Oh, well, oh, well they, they, they were. So you're Clowns Anonymous. So yes. uh, yeah, a, a, a friend of mine, a playwright, uh, she, she had written um, a play um, that, that turned into a, a movie for the uh, Trop Fest. Uh, two years ago. Oh yeah, they, fin they, they, they finished Trop Fest, didn't they? That was such a shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we, 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 That was that was the last. Um, so we, we, they needed an actor at last minute. So they contacted me. They said, "You don't have to worry. Um, there's no lines. You just have to act like a clown in recovery." So I went, "Sure, absolutely." And so that was that was nice to get back to it. So yeah, look, you know, balancing. I think a lot of my work with trauma is, is being able to balance it with something a little bit lighter, so that we can maintain that uh, that mm. balance in life. Well, I think many people can relate to to clowns being a bit scary. I don't have a great relationship with them. <laughs> it seemed a bit tragic to me. Yeah, well, no, the, the filming of it was exactly the same. We actually had one bus stop scene and um, here in Sydney, and uh, I, I think that still holds true because every time that someone would approach, they didn't realize we were filming, and when they saw that it was a, uh, there was there were two or three clowns standing around the bus stop, they actually went across the street two blocks down to the next bus stop. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, when we left off, we were talking about the early days uh, as a serious actor and then the realisation that that may not be a sustainable career and then yeah. how you segued uh, very jaggedly into, the, into policing. So what happened next? Uh, because you eventually moved to Australia. Yeah. So yeah, after after about uh, a little over ten years of accumulation, um, you know, just just trauma, you know, workplace stress, um, I actually founded the uh, the, the uh, sheriff's department's uh, first canine unit. I guess with for our you know, dog squad here in Australia. And uh, look at that, and that was great to have a partner that you know at least he got me, um, if nobody else did. At the end of the day, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Eventually, I. Um, you know, it, it just it, it cracked, uh, put the cracks in me, and I did have to retire. Um, you know, without wanting to, because of that, I lost my identity. Wound up with multiple hospitalizations. Um, you know, lost my identity, and uh, you know, met my wife, um, who was from Sydney, and she said, "Hey, um, you know, would love to have you to come out to Australia. Never been out to Australia, so as a way of classical avoidance um, in trauma." Um, I thought, well, Australia is about as far as you can possibly get from America, <laughs> and any kind of triggers or reminders. Um, so, yeah, I'll definitely take you up on that. Um, and arrived here, fell in love with the city, um, the country, and stayed for another 10 years. Um, and, and both of my sons were born here. And were you, because uh, you had a bit of a foray into photography as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So look, we we always want to do the next thing. That so when when I couldn't be a policeman no more, um, 
I was encouraged to do, well, what did you love? And I had always had a passion for photography. So that became, you know, with a lot of encouragement, um, my next chapter of career uh, because, you know, the only time I did photography in my law enforcement job was, uh, you know, crime scene. Um, mm-hmm. And that, there's just a lot of still lifes in that, in that kind of a, an environment. So it really wasn't an opportunity for creativity. <laughs> no. Um, so, no, no. So um, I, I eventually went into wedding photography. I didn't tell a lot of my brides. And if there haven't been any listening, I do apologize that, um, you know, you know my, my previous work was, <laughs> was actually crime scene photography. But then <laughs> transitioned nicely into wedding photography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's many puns that could be attached to that, but let's move on. Yeah, we will go. <laughs> we will keep going. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I came, you know, came to Australia, reinvented myself. Um, we moved up to the Whit Sundays because um, it just was more of an idyllic life for our sons, um, and uh, gave me an opportunity to pretty much do photography every day. Um, you know, just it was for me. It, it was therapy. I was like, you know, every day there were you know rainbows over the coral sea. You know, amazing wildlife. Um, you know, just a very serene piece of life. Um, mm. But we did that again for another eight years or so, and my wife suggested that maybe it was about time for the boys to. Uh, they were getting restless, so they were they were about six and seven at that point, and really getting a little bit less. Rest, restless with the island life. It's like, hey, you know, hey guys, you want to go on the on the weekend? Would you like to go out to Daydream Island? No, not the <laughs> islands again. No, no. Can we do something fun? Um, they're tired of tropical life. So my wife said, look, maybe we could take them back and have them experience a little bit of your culture and history and family. You know, we can reconnect with family back in the states. So she had she had been very impacted with uh, when Columbine happened. So she spent. The next year, actually researching one of the, trying to find the safest community for us to move back to. Um, low crime statistics, being a typical Australian, <laughs> she wanted to be close to water. Um, so it had to be with, you know, so the, the stipulations were one hour to water, need to be close to culture, and it needed to be safe. Um, so she eventually, through many board postings and research, came up with Newtown. Um, and within Newtown, there was a smaller village that we, we, we we lived in, which was Sandy Hook, and they hadn't had any violence there for, again, another 25 years, had not a single murder of any kind. Um, beautiful school system, um, very rural, so it kind of reminded the kids, would you be, you know, so it wouldn't be a culture shock as mm. far as environment. Um, so, yeah, so we, we did that, and again, I continued uh, with my photography um, Tried to reconnect with theater photography, so I started finding some opportunities to get, you know, trying to get back as close as I could to on stage. So even if I'm in the orchestra pit with a camera, I'm yeah. close enough to the board boards again. So that I was still wanting to be close to that drama and that um, that lifestyle. And and that's when how, how long and were you there? But, so yeah, we were we were there for about. Oh, Four years had just gotten just gotten really, you know, really stable, and um, you know, you know, our youngest son actually stayed home that day. So he, he said, "I don't feel well. Can I stay home?" I'm saying, "Yeah, sure. Why not?" Can I just um, ask you before I'll, before you you go, yes, go into that? Yes. How were you? How was your mental health at this stage? So look, I've I've I've, I've always been practicing avoidance. So as far as a coping strategy, so coming to Australia was classical avoidance for trauma. Now, but. It's not a, a maladaptive strategy because I like Australia. Mm. So I had been very settled, um, had been off medication for years at that point. Um, so, so actually feeling very stable that, you know, life was good. Uh, we were safe. Um, you know, I'm never going to have to deal with trauma again because I'm not a police officer. I'm not a first responder. So, did, so would you have considered very, yourself recovered then? Um, no, because I, I still had bad dreams. So, so there's there's a level of recovery which you can live with. So I can still I, I would say that I had a good sense of well being. So even though I still had some symptoms, um, you know, occasionally you would you know if I didn't get a lot of sleep, you might have a flashback. You mm. might have bad dreams. So I wouldn't say recovered. I, I wish that I could. Um, there's you know short term memory is a big problem for me. Um, Try to keep uh, keep thoughts straight and the less sleep I get the more stressed I get so, so recover mm. I had a good sense of well-being so we'll, we'll, we'll say that 
Yes. It's interesting because, you know, uh, speaking about uh, signs and symptoms of any mental health challenge, it's different for everybody. And yes. I think that's something uh, people should consider addressing, you know, when they are living, working, dealing with people who uh, disclose their mental health issues, that it is different. It's more about what does it feel like being you rather than what have you got, what are you taking for it, <laughs> when are you going to yeah. recover? <laughs> No, but yeah, what, what, what does it mean to you and what do you, you know, you know what is distressing yeah. for you? Yeah, well, thank, we thank, you for, yeah. thank you for sharing oh, no, that because no. um, I just, no, no, just wanted to just make that quite clear before you move into this next bit, which was just another level of trauma for you and then what happened next with that overlay. Yeah, so yeah, so having the belief that you know trauma is not going to reach out and touch me because you know I'm on the civilian side of it now in a in a idyllic, we would say kind of Norman Rockwell kind of a, an American setting. You know, just couldn't have been more picturesque, couldn't have been more um, uh, you know small town America, quintessential small town idyllic America. Um, so we thought, yeah, we're beyond that reach of having to deal with another trauma um but sadly you know you know on that morning um you know like i said you know thankfully our youngest son had decided to stay home sick that morning um and our oldest had went to the high school which is uh, across kind of geographically kind of across the street just a, a little ways from from the, the school so the first that i was aware of it was i was actually working on my computer and i'll never forget so this little Pop up pops up on Messenger that we'd got an automated message that came through that said that there's a report of a school shooting, um, and I went, "Well, that's interesting." I, I, I didn't even think nothing of it, and um, and I went and I went and told my wife. I said, um, "Did you just get a message?" And and I, I told her what it was, and, and you know, I'll never forget the look on her face. You know, just went pale white because basically at that point her worst nightmare had was about to come true. Um, and, but being the p policeman in me kicked in really quickly to go, look, no, that, that couldn't have happened. So I'm going to start justifying it by going, look, there's probably hunters because it was a very wooded area. And we had hunters out there all the time. So it's probably somebody has seen the hunters and heard some shots. Um, okay, now it's definitely you know, being confirmed that there are casualties. So I still go into that um, trying to not believe the worst by going, well, it's probably domestic, so it's probably limited to, you know, one or two people, adults. Um, so that's probably what this is. And then my son texted me and said that, no, I'm actually receiving actual. So before I even, before CNN was even broadcasting, we were getting live um, updates as far as what was really happening. So at that point, I knew that our lives had changed and all of my attention was focused on him surviving um, the next, couple hours while the school went in lockdown and um, there was reports of multiple shooters and um, eventually you know, um, you know he disclosed to us sometimes later that he actually closed the, they closed the school door they barricaded it with chairs and he had already told his fellow classmates that if the person comes into the room that they were all going to throw chairs he had already taken the lead that he was going to defend the class um, mm. And just think that, you know, kids should never have to face, I mean, just even having to have lockdown drills is, is, is a sad, um, you know, sad reality. state of affairs. Mm. Yeah, reality moving forward. But, you know, when that bus, the school bus eventually did come home later that afternoon and he got off and, you know, you, you, it's probably the, the biggest hug that you, you could possibly ever imagine. And, um, yeah, probably for the next year, I think I, I did nothing but cry on and off consistently. Mm. Did that set off any of your your triggers? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all all of them. Every, every possible bing, bing, alarm bing. bell, <laughs> bing, bing, bing. So you know, you become hyper reactive. My startle response, you know, all, you know, um, because it didn't stop then. Because then we would have crank pots that would, um, you know, send false alarms to the school. So every maybe once a week, I was getting one of my sons texting me saying, "Hey, we've got a, a threat." Um, so it, it didn't end that day. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I dare say it still hasn't ended in, in, in my research when, you know, I wanted to yeah. have a look at this idyllic place, Sandy Hook, and you can't really Google what it looks like there because all of the media is related oh, to the event. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and sadly, if you put it into YouTube, all it is is conspiracy and you know, it, it's, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's, it's a shame because no one should even know that word, to be honest. The community mm -hmm. was so small. Um, 
but at the end of the day, I'm, it was extremely grateful for my sons, you know, you know, making it through that. While some of the other people that I've come to know that their their children didn't. So I, you know, I'm very grateful. It doesn't mean that they're not scarred and that they lost their innocence that day. No. How, how do they uh, cope with it now? Or how do they live with it, given it's part of their uh, part of their tapestry? Um, they. They, they, they've both flourished, uh, and that's why I said, you know, it's, I'm, I'm really proud. You talk about Australia being the lucky country, is the fact that they were able to come back, and after a short amount of time, they were actually quite happy to go back into classrooms and schools because they, they understood the culture. Mm. So they actually felt safer here very quickly, um, which I was very proud of. They were, they were happy to go back out into the community and, uh, you know, just get on a, a bus and explore the city. How long did it take um, you to come back? So we, we that's, a, that's actually a very good question. So, yeah, for, you know, so as a parent, I became very enraged um, because something like that happening, you just can't ignore it. And I had to be faced with the fact that eventually I had to put my kids back on a school bus, and that brought up a lot. Um, so I thought, well, I'm putting them back on a bus, but nothing has changed um, around that gun violence culture and um, those issues. So I thought, well, I, I need this see how I can get involved to make some change because mm. this isn't okay. So really the next two years I became a strong um, gun violence uh, advocate, mm. mainly because I thought, I thought I could actually bridge that gap between those two entrenched camps of, uh, you know, no guns and whatever gun I want. Um, so I thought as a law enforcement officer, I could have added a voice into that um, <laughs> um, into conversation. That, which you did. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, look, I did. I, we, we, we raised a lot of awareness. Um, um, I think, as I've spent, said to you, that we, we had an un, unwanted spotlight. So even though we lost you know, 20 children that day, I, you know, I, I then became friends with people from Aurora, um, Columbine. So every mass shooting after then reached out to me, um, and I reached out to them. Mm. And we became a very, you know, kind of the club that nobody wants to belong to. Um, mm. But, but it was very supportive. So I, I pretty much know, you know, most of my friends now are, you know, are people that have been impacted or touched by this. Um, but yeah, the, the, the numbers in America, look, eventually everybody's going to know at least one person that's been touched by gun violence. Yeah, yeah. and you described a moment to me on that uh, when we had our first uh, catch up about when you were in a marquee with all your fancy food and I think President Obama was there and there were people behind a barricade and you walked out. Can you describe that moment? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, we, we were invited to go to D.C. for a, a march, which just really, you know, of course, I, you know, at that time I was joining any march. I'll sign any petition. I'll speak anywhere on the topic um, if we can bring awareness to it. So we had traveled to Washington and um, thousands and thousands of people came and we were treated as VIPs. And so they, they had organized the march, but at that point none of the families... Um, and this was an anti anti gun. Yeah, this 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 was an anti anti gun, and 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 it's more and more. It was more about sensible legislation. So it's less about anti gun, but it's like, well, can we at least agree that we have background checks? Can we at least agree that certain types of cop killer ammunition aren't used? So there was a lot. There was a lot of legislation. So it wasn't anti gun. It was. But can we put some things in place so that they're not as easily accessible and, and, and nobody needs a, a weapon that has the capacity of, of 100 rounds? That's, yeah. not, that's, not, that's not for sport or any of that. So we arrived in D.C., um, treated to this VIP tent. It was very cold. You know, they literally hung these VIP uh, lanyards over us. Yeah, we did the march, and I'm marching right up front of it, you know, leading this, you know, thousands of people behind us, um, myself and my family, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the mayor of D.C. Um, and then they treated us to this lovely lunch in a heated tent. And then we looked out at the Washington Monument, and I noticed that they had these barricades, and all these people were waving. So I thought, well, look, I, you know, I'm going to go over and say hi. And I noticed that they had the, these buttons. Uh, and I've come to know from survivors of for, And for, the, for our so Australian um, listeners, buttons mean um, badges. <laughs> <laughs> badges. <laughs> photo badges. Photo badges. Yes. Um, so for, I noticed that a lot of these adults had had uh, these photo badges, and they were all children. So I realized that they had lost children. And at that moment, I felt like such a fraud. And um, you know, I, I wanted to actually knock that barricade over, invite them in. And probably in retrospect, if I, if I was to go back and do it again, I think I would have done that. Mm. Um, because 
they were the true people that, that needed to be in there being fed and pampered and, um, and, and, and we, we needed to hear their voices. Yeah. Um, so, it, so it was at that point that I then started more working with the survivors. So it was less about, I knew I wasn't going to clean up the, um, the legislation or have an impact in that way, but I thought, well, I do understand trauma and, um, you know, you know, myself being, um, you know, when I did leave the, the force, you know, I did attempt to, uh, you know, you know, take my own life. So I thought, well, I, I know how people can feel hopeless. So maybe this is where I'm best suited is supporting the survivors. So that's really where that moment, uh, I went from an advocate there, more of a champion of uh, giving the uh, survivors support and a mm. voice. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were working with the survivors uh, eventually. How did yeah. that impact your own uh, trauma? Oh, and and that's, that's a great question because, um, you know, my wife said, she said, do you think that's really a good idea? <laughs> you know, talking to people and, uh, constantly about listening to their stories because it was pretty much at that point um, that um, uh, we had an amazing woman um, who had lost her daughter in Aurora, and she, she skillfully knew how to use her daughter's death at the, uh, at the theater as a way of getting people's attention. So when we talk about trauma-informed, she knew how to do it in the ver ver reverse way to actually, you know, just the story, it would just tear you apart. It's just mm. so visceral. And my wife heard it and she said, I think that's kind of enough for me as far as being an advocate. Um, I don't want to hear that no more. I can't hear it no more. Whereas I was just, you know, just empowered by it. Um, yes. That these people knew how to use their stories um, for a bigger cause and to bring awareness to certain um, events, and I thought, how, I, I want to be with these people. I, I want to, you know, I want to learn from these people first of all, and I want to support them where I can. Yeah, and so I guess that comes from actually, training as well, doesn't it? Because you you are a qualified counsellor. Yes. Um, so so that yeah. yeah. So when we when we decided to move back to Australia, we 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 all decided to live our dreams, and mine was then to actually um, to study psychotherapy and become a counselor. So I had a better skill set. You know, I, yeah. I could automatically empathize with everyone, but I thought I need to do better. Yes, and and I guess all those you know, I've been practicing myself for you know almost fifteen years, and I know without that proper training um, and and degree that. You know, I, I would be vicariously traumatised given that I live with, you know, major depression and anxiety and suicidal um, tendencies as well mm, yeah. that, you know, I r rarely get affected. You know, there have been a few times uh, during my career where somebody has slipped under the radar and, you know, pushed a few buttons. But, uh, yeah. you know, I think that's that's the benefit of working with professional people. It doesn't matter what your mental health challenge might be. Um, you know, the profession is the profession. The profession is a profession, and 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 and, and we talk about you know, we've talked about um, you know vicarious trauma, and we uh, to me uh, there's also this vicarious inspiration. So often you know, and, and I do work in the clinical education, so I actually teach um, clinicians now around trauma informed care, and we talk about you know, vicarious trauma. But I try to remind people that are working with people that have been through an event or a loss or a grief um, that even though we're in this vicarious trauma setting, and we're also, if you can kind of reframe and re-look through another lens, that we're also sitting with somebody that has had an amazing resiliency. They've gotten through things. They've, um, so I've, I've learned that I've got this vicarious compassion, this vicarious resilience by sitting with such people and listening to their stories and, and being just so grateful to hear such stories. Mm. Yeah, no, it, it's it's a it's a blessing, isn't it? And um, absolutely for those of us who who work in that space, you know, we we feel very grateful to be able to hear people's stories and uh, and to be able to empathise and hopefully at some stage be able to offer some kind of um, support in how to manage manage better with what you've got. Yeah. And as I tell people, it's like, I'm not an expert in anyone's life. I'm still working on mine. <laughs> still, you know, we're, still, we're, still, we're still working on we're still working in progress. However, you know, I'm very curious, with, you know, and I'm happy to walk with people. And, and I know for a fact that they have what they need within them. We just have to support them until they can connect the dots. Yes. And uh, that's where a lot, a lot of that recovery happens. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that up front is, you know, I, I don't have any answers. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, that's the disclaimer right up front. 
uh, but I will walk with you until you find and find what you need, um, and that looks different, as you know, for for everybody. Yes, that's right. Um, towards the end of the show, I'm interested to know what it feels like being you today, and and how you're managing. <laughs> but I, I guess I sort of get the sense um, that you know, as we grow and develop and and gather more insights and experiences, that uh, things don't necessarily get easier. We just manage them better. Uh, with that, with that resilience that we collect, uh, but we are going to go to another break, Darren. Uh, but when yep. we come back, Good. we're going to talk about the Phoenix Project, which is uh, 26 pebbles and how verbatim theatre can be a therapeutic tool for for trauma. I actually even heard recently that, um, as a offshoot from our very very recent bushfires, some of those affected communities have used verbatim theatre to air stories and, and help heal the trauma. Yeah, yeah, I, I've heard the same thing and, and uh, definitely actually want to be reaching out to those communities in the near future. Yes, because I guess uh, people listening in, 26 Pebbles is, a, is a, a derivative of the tragedy that happened at uh, Newton Elementary School. That's the 26 um, people that represents 26, but you, Darren, you think there should be 28 Pebbles? Yeah. Look, you know, it, 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 it's, a it's a contention within a community because, look, when you're first injured, when, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure all, every viewer and everyone that's listening can, can relate, is the fact that when you're wounded, um, sometimes we don't want to, to honor those people. We don't, they don't feel that they, you know, but to be honest, you know, even those two extra pebbles in that pond that morning um, rippled out in whatever way. There were, you know, they had mm. family, they had friends, they had lives. Um, so even those ripples. Um, so you know, you know, I, I would I would say looking at that those ripples still exist. Maybe we, we don't want to focus on them, but they they still they, they were still there. Yeah, it it is very contentious, and um, you know it's hard to get your head around sometimes when it is just such a graphic memory that whoever is a dare we say perpetrator also has an experience of life that's led them to that moment and you know some of me feels that if you know, we applied a lot more early intervention strategy to some people that really really needed support perhaps we might not see some of these outcomes and if, I, and if I could rewrite the, you know, the first song we played, Bad Boys, is that they, they really weren't bad boys. They, you know, maybe we could re, I could re, re uh, if I had engineering skills and musical talent, I could say it was a, it was a bad, bad system, um, you know, that was in place that didn't support them, that let them fall through the gaps. Um, so, you know, it, when I was a police officer, I loved that song and thought, oh, yeah, bad boys. And, um, and, and, it, and I had come across some incidences, and Sandy Hook would be one, that, you know, often evil comes up into that conversation. Mm. Um, but, you know, over the years, I've really, you know, I've shifted my, and, I, and I've grown as a person to understand that, um, yeah, look, you know, these, these events, um, I don't condone them, but I, I, when I talk to more and more people, um, I can actually understand them better. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. With without, <laughs> I say to people, if I would have known what befell me, you know, at the age of two or three, I would have gone, "Oh, bugger that! I'm out of here now." <laughs> one step at a time, and we gain one momentum. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, tell us about your second special guest song request, Darren. It's um, from the musical Godspell, which I Godspell, think, yeah, yeah, that was created in about in the early '70s, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so Stephen Schwartz had created it. So again, getting back to my theater roots, um, a after the event, um, probably within about a few weeks, um, people started reaching out wanting to do stuff for us and because Sandy Hook was only about an hour from Broadway. Um, our community had been contacted by some Broadway directors and stuff and said, look, we want to we want to come and heal the community with theater. And I said, well, that's fantastic. I said, however, you know, as much as we would love a show, we would love to get involved and give our kids an outlet. So they took that feedback on board, and over the course of about three to four weeks, we brought 600 musicians, professional actors, set designers, Sesame Street, to a, a one-night show for the community um, called From Broadway with Love. Mm. Um, so I got to be a part, a part of that. But 
unknowingly, uh, Stephen Schwartz was actually wanted. He was another person that felt he he needed to do something that that night. So he uh, he he dedicated this uh, this lovely lovely song for those people that haven't heard it. Beautiful city, because we didn't want to f- we didn't want to focus on the tragedy. Um, you know, we we felt it. We it, it's it's a known quantity. We wanted to we wanted to live beyond that. We wanted to. Um, honor those lives and that day. Mm. So he dedicated this song, Beautiful City, to our community. And so he played a grand piano up on stage, and the director asked me if I had, as the town's photographer, if I had any images. So they put together a little slideshow, and Stephen played this song um, while my images um, were being broadcast. And I I think I cried through that whole afternoon (laughs) as well. Um, (laughs) I cried the drop of a hat, you know. And I don't apologize for it. Well, you so, shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, the fact that no. that even came out of your mouth. In fact, uh, Mark, uh, who has been um, tuned in during this show and sending a quite a steady stream of commentary, thank you very much, Mark, mentioned that um, most men don't know how to cry, and I would strongly object to that because uh, in my yeah. world, my day is not complete until a man has cried, and oh, and I usually achieve that every day. And uh, I've said this many times on the show, if we create environments for men that is safe, respectful, preserves pride, preserves dignity and masculinity, men will talk, show emotion and seek help. It's just that we just have bugger all of it around for no, them. And I love your work. And it is creating this environment. Sadly, it took this event for our community. So, you know, probably within the first week, whenever any of us, because it was a very small community, so we all knew one each other, each other to a degree. So when we would meet and see each other, because eventually you've got to go back to shopping, and that was kind of one of the harder things, very surreal to go live through this and go, well, actually, but we've run out of groceries. Oh, we need toilet paper. Mm. And we actually had toilet paper in the groceries, so that was, again, luckily one other thing we didn't have to live through. Mm. Um, but we, when, as men, whenever we would see each other, we would actually walk up to one another, hug, and not just a pat on the back, hey, mate, how you doing? Um, you know, you know um, this was a real heartfelt, um, you could feel each other breathing, possibly crying. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that went on until the day that I left, pretty much. Um, that as, as men, we, it, it changed. In, so that was one interesting thing in that community. Um, and so whenever I speak, I talk about that I, I'm quite a big hugger now. And if <laughs> I do speak, people come, people will come up after when I talk and say, can I give you a hug? I'm like, oh, please, yes. <laughs> well, not <laughs> not do. anymore, Darren. Not, um, no, 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 no. Social distancing. No, so, social <laughs> distancing. Yeah. yeah, this year has been completely different. We, we do all yes. these air hugs and air handshakes and uh yeah. You know what I'm really loving about that? And this is, you know, a bit off topic, but I love that we are using our natural expression to connect with each other. Now we're looking at each other's eyes, we're looking at each other's faces um, and, and bodies and movements to see what the tone is. Yes, um, yeah. And I, I think it's, we, 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 we understand that we can't, but there's this still, I think it's even a deeper moment. Sometimes we have these, these handshakes and it's just very, you know, very quick, doesn't mean as much. But you're right, now we're, we're really looking at one another. We're searching. Um, and taking, yeah. yeah, we're searching. Yeah, we're searching. How do we still connect? How do we, how do we keep each other safe? Um, you know, I, I want to keep you safe. I want to be safe. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's you know, something that you know, maybe it's a, definitely a positive that we may, we may come out of this with. Yes. Yeah. The way, you know, we, we, we've had to slow down, really slow down and put the brakes on and take time to look and to feel and to feel that level of um, being uncomfortable and um and, and not knowing, you know, the, the unknown mm. and being uncertain is not a bad thing. You know, uncertainty no. is being certain in itself. Yeah. And that's about the only thing we can be certain of. Yes, because what we know, I mean, even this show today, uh, whilst it's about, you know, your, your journey and, um, you know, how you've managed, it's demonstrative that change happens all the time. We don't know when it's coming. However, if, yeah. yeah, we need to, pre- pre- sorry to um, overrun you there, no. but, you know, preparing is so important. Have your support circles in place, people. And what I mean by that is before change happens, know where the first place you go to when things change. So the first place you go to, it might be your, your mum or dad or your brother, sister, it might even be something like exercise or, or riding your bike or painting, but have a plan. So once you've established who's your main 
what's your main point to keep you upright during the time of change, then as those circles reverberate, the next one is, you know, could be people at your gym, next door neighbours, the next one could be workmates, it could be your doctor. So fill that in just so when, when change happens, you've got somewhere um, to support you and keep you upright. And I like that when you said, that, you know, when change happens, because I, I used to, you know, I'd go out and, you know, scream at the clouds and go, why again? <laughs> why? You know, come on. It's been, you know, really, you know, the irony, God, you've messed with me one, one too many times. You know, yeah. now I accept when change happens. And it's, yes. it's always, it's always going. But I, but I love that developing a plan because, you know, so yeah. many of us will, 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 will consider our funeral arrangements mm. and we'll make sure that we've got a, we've got a will and we've got the funeral stuff in, in place. But having, and, and that's when I work with a lot of my clients and stuff, is that working with people when you're well, and that's your mental health, your mental yes. health as well, to develop that plan. Like you said, to, you know, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't had some amazing supports around me, family, friends, um, eventually some great clinicians that believed in me, then educators that said, hey, you can go back to school. Mm -hmm. um, so developing those while you're well, so you because know, you know what's best for you. Yes. If you get in, if you get into the system, the system doesn't know you, mm. and the system sometimes doesn't have time to get to know you, and so your your results vary. That's right, and and now is the time where people didn't expect this magnitude of change and so many people didn't have a plan, uh, a mental health mm. plan or a financial plan. So that's where we're seeing some really, really uh, terrible outcomes for people and so many people in, in dire straits. Yeah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that we're we're still at the at the beginning of this. It's kind of like a tsunami. I would kind of say that we've we've all gone to the beach and we're very curious because the water has gone out to the horizon and we're going. Well, isn't that unusual? And we just don't know mental health wise that over the next couple of years. And you know, as we've talked about several times, is the uh, you know, the entertainment industry, um, but 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 all industries and all people for the next several years, um, there's going to be a lot of mental health concerns. Yes. Yeah, but again, it's bringing it to the surface, and uh, it it doesn't discriminate. And I think this has really made a very level playing field for a mental health challenge. It's not, you mm -hmm. know, people mm -hmm. with low socioeconomic um, footing who get who get mentally ill. It's anyone. And it's anybody, and yeah. that and, and and that level playing field is is when I went, I, I I was on a few months ago when it, when this first broke out. I was on the unit, um, one of our uh, inpatient units, and we we were watching the TV in the day room and watching people fighting over toilet paper, um, literally fighting for toilet paper, and everyone's just glued to the TV. And I, and I asked them, I said, "Well, what do you think about that?" They said, "That's well, awful." I said, "And they call us crazy, yeah. really." <laughs> this is how this is what's happening out there, and then, you know we're in here, and we're the ones that are unwell. Um, <laughs> and I said, okay, it really has been a level playing field. I said because everybody has, you know, to some degree, has been impacted financially. Um, they may have to stand uh, in the queue at CenterLink. Mm. Um, so more people are going to have an understanding. So yeah, I like that about leveling the playing field. Yeah. Hey, without further ado, let's get into this song, shall we? From Godspell. Let's do it. What is it, and um, you've already told me why. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah no, so this is Stephen Schwartz's um, Beautiful City from the musical Godspell. Fantastic. Well, everybody, uh, we're, when we come back, we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, 26 Pebbles and also really what it feels like being you, Darren, today. Great. And, Great. Uh, Looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, um, everybody, you're listening to 94.1 FM. It's 3WBC, and you're here with Ray Bonnie. Do not go away. Oh, there it is. Beautiful city. Um, that's part of Godspell, uh, the musical, which was first uh, brought to the stage back in around... 1971. Welcome back everyone. The time is now 38 minutes past 11 and you're listening to 94.1 FM. It's 3WBC with Ray Bonnie joined by Mass Trauma Specialist uh, who's also recently completed a master's degree in health and so social well-being. It's Darren Wagner. Great. Oh, thank you so much for that. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I love that song. I think it's beautiful. You know, one, because it was that yeah, it was it was dedicated, and and it focused on the the, the coming out of it. Um, it's 
so it acknowledges that you know we've had this you know broken spirit and and, and we can get crushed by it but you know we, we can build for, um, yeah. you know, a better a better life and a better future yeah well i do have a bit of a shout out uh while we were playing that song darren my friend amanda gilly muntun uh, who is also a friend of 3WBC. She has presented with me numerous times over the years and she has very, very good radio voice. Uh, she said that she's loving the show and she said, without a doubt, it has been so real and true and touching. I've been mesmerised and you sharing this affects people in ways you'll never know. So there you go, Darren. That's well, how well, you've impacted you, the world. Yeah. Well, and she's very yeah. beautiful. And yeah. we, we are going for a walk after this. It, rain, hail or shine. It's about to start raining in Melbourne, but uh, taking my uh, dog, Vincent, he's a French <laughs> bulldog, we're going for a, a walk. Good, fr- good, fr- good friends are hard to come by. Thank you for that, Amanda. No, that, that's beautiful. You'd like her. She, she's one of the tribe. Now, with respect to your study, you've just completed your master's degree. Yeah. And you're ready to jump yeah. straight into a PhD, is that right? <laughs> Look, I, I barely graduated high school, so so to be able to have a mental health challenge, um, but I, I have focused, um, you know, uh, I've gone from the, psych, you know, the psychotherapy component to actually research, so I'm involved in a lot of lived experience research around how people utilize their story, yep. and again, re- reconnecting with theater and uh, the Pebbles Project. Yep. Oh. So, yeah, the, the, the degree I never thought I would actually complete, so just kind of really stoked that that happened, uh, submitted the last paper last week. So that's uh, jumping straight into a PhD. Look, I may, I may watch the landscape for the next year because I think, uh, because I am concerned with, as you said, you know, so the Phoenix Project was my, my initial concept of a, uh, a PhD proposal around how verbatim, and for people that don't, have never heard the term verbatim theater, really what it encompasses is Often they're around an event, and usually it's a trauma-related event. And the playwright will go to the community, um, as, as, as you mentioned, Ray, is the fact that we've had our, our bushfires earlier this year. Yes. And um, I, I think there's, there was one done even around the, uh, the earthquake that we had here um, some time back. But the playwright will go to the community, and it's less about the event, but how people were impacted by that. Yes. And the, the playwright will interview each of the... the uh, individuals and and the verbatim part comes in so if i say um um ah uh, it's captured verbatim and the actor is expected to, to then repeat those ums and ahs and uh, in, in verbatim mm. so all of those little story threads uh, from that event the the playwright and in, in our case was an amazing man by the name of uh, eric Urola. I'm glad you can pronounce yeah. that because I was practicing it before I thought. Oh, oh well, look! If, if he happens <laughs> to listen, and I, I'm, I'm sure I've butchered it because I haven't said it in a while. But um, no, look, Eric was an amazing uh, playwright. And again, just like um, a lot of the theater from uh, New York had contacted us and said he actually wanted. He was inspired by a play called uh, The Laramie Project. Yes, yes. And that was the yeah, that, that was, was the play about the um, the the gay guy that was murdered. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So he was inspired by that, and he thought that might be the best way for me to process and tell this story. And he uh, approached us, and we started having conversations. And myself and my wife was one, one of the early um, interviews. And at that time, I was talking to anybody that would listen, I'm not giving it much thought. Um, one hour interview done, over, I move on to my next project, move on to my next life back in Australia. Um, come to find out last year, um, somebody on social media had reached out to my wife and said, hey, um, I'm actually playing you in, the, in this production of 26 Pebbles and um, just wanted to thank you. Um, and that, at that point, we both did, went back and did some research and had, had realized that this show had been done well over 100 times all around the world mm. um, by professional companies, amateur companies, um, so yeah. it was really quite a, an, an eye opener. It was and, ri- it was written I've for been. a very broad stage, I um, understand, and it was first premiered at the Human Race Theatre in in Dayton, Ohio, on yeah. February in February two thousand and seventeen. Yeah, again, ironic because you know I had been a police officer um, just the uh, adjacent county over, so for it to have that play 
uh, the, the irony was not lost on me that that story was told. And, and Eric, um, just, just about a month or two ago, he, he tweeted out to me and he said, hey, just want to let you know that there's been well, well over 100 people who've played you. Um, wow. And I thought, wow, that's really How, What surreal. does that feel like? Given that it's v- yeah. verbatim as well. So if, the, if somebody was playing a sense of you, that's something different than actually using your words. Yeah, so, so and that, that's the interesting thing is I've, I've started having actors and directors contacting me from, from various um, areas around America saying that they're, they're really honoured to tell this story, but because it is a real story, they, they take it a lot more seriously. So the actors really take on board that, that trauma story and, and they really want to honour it. Um, which is beautiful from the acting point of view, but uh, I think that's where I've started to develop my new awareness around the actors and how they can be traumatized because I was contacted by one actor who was playing me who that actually vicariously was traumatized by telling my story. Yes, well, that, that's the other thing, isn't it, when we're talking about verbatim theatre, is that how that could affect people that are acting the, the roles? Mm. Uh, whilst it does yeah. have very therapeutic... Um, qualities to it for you know people in the community perhaps it also can have um, you know that that adverse effect too yeah and, and, for, and for the audience so the story the story is really about just how each of us have um, and I did hadn't even realized because you know we, we you know, I've auditioned for many plays when I was much younger and you would get a you know, you'd go up to the bullet board and you go oh, I made the play um, <laughs> That never, that never happened with Pebbles. I just, you know, I'm contacted years later after it had been produced many times and uh, people reaching out to say, well, um, similar to what you, so what's it like to be you? How can I play you? Um, and I thought, well, that's quite, quite the question. Um, how do you play me? Yeah. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's, as, a, as an aspiring actor, I, I've been faced with this the dilemma that uh, if it's ever done in Australia, um, if I was to ever audition, um, I, I don't know how I would handle if I auditioned for, uh, for the role of me and mm. I didn't get it. Mm. How, how, would I, how, would I, how would I take that 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 <laughs> that is a, is a rejection um, if I didn't <laughs> didn't get that role? So I don't think I'll be auditioning. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if it's a conflict of interest as well. <laughs> it would be. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. It sure, it would be. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and and it's funny because I play myself all the time, so I don't. You know, that that's one role I don't need to, to do. Well, even perhaps that version of you has grown and developed significantly as well since then. So, yeah, um, whatever exactly. they capture, and that's the beauty again of verbatim is that you know, they yeah. capture that exact moment, and that's frozen in time. It doesn't. It doesn't and move. I, yeah. And I, and I tell the actress that's a, that it's your role. You, know, you make it yours. That you know something that's speaking to you. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, now I, now I think that because I, I actually went to a play here in Sydney last year, the Laramie Project actually came to Sydney at the Edmore, and uh, the director contacted me, and I actually got to interview the cast um, before the show. And I said, "How many?" I said, "You're telling this story about this community being impacted." I said, "How does how, is, how is that feel?" Mm. Um, and one of the, the lead actresses, she stood up and just started weeping openly and said, look, you know, I, I'm having nightmares. Um, it's really bothered me. I'm not sleeping well. Um, and, and all of the fellow cast, including the director, kind of look over and go, oh, wow. Um, so this is, a re- this is a real thing, and we're not talking about it. Mm. Yes, that's the thing, isn't it? Um, people living in such isolation with extreme feelings and experiences. And, and, and on that, I just really want to just give a shout out to everyone that's listening in. Uh, we love feedback. Uh, that's great. So if you want to contact me, you can at uh, my email address, which is ray, R-A-E dot Bonnie, B-O-N-N-E-Y at 3wbc.org.au or jump on Facebook and look me up there. Uh, also, uh, you can contact John Farmer, our station manager, on 039-285-4846. Now, if any of our discussions today have brought up uncomfortable feelings for listeners, please remember help is there. Uh, There's a few options for further support, such as Lifeline on 131114. The Suicide Callback Service is 1300 659 Four six seven and emergency services is triple zero. If it's an emergency, dial it. That's what it's there for. Absolutely. Um, yeah, 
know, don't, don't you know, this is this is why I wound up with PTS is because you know not not being able to, to I was you know not honoring the flags that were popping up and then mm. being dismissive and then being too proud um, to put my hand up and say I, I need support. Yes, and it's very much like the physical health analogy is, you know, if you've got an injury and you don't put your broken arm in plaster, it's going to exacerbate and it's going to get worse until it drops off. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. There, there's a visual. Oh, there's a visual. <laughs> if it doesn't feel right, it's not right, and that's the time. You know, we have lots of different options uh, for help and support, and, you know, one of the great things that's come out of COVID as well is making... Uh, um, health support more accessible through telehealth. So, uh, you know, I've, I know that I've switched to a telehealth program for my clients and uh, whilst I thought, oh, it won't be as good, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very good. Uh, it, yeah. It's sometimes some, somewhat even better in some respects because you take the travel away. Um, I did also want to remind everyone, Darren, also um, about Entertainment Assist. Uh, we mentioned yeah. it earlier in the show and... You know, my work there is developing uh, pr the program Intermission, which is mental health training specifically for people in the Australian entertainment industry. And it is based on research uh, that was conducted in 2014 by Entertainment Assist with uh, Victoria University and Victorian College of the Arts. And it's very compelling. And I noticed, Darren, that you've used... Um, You've used our statistics in your research. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they, I look, the, 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 the mental health statistics are just shocking to begin with, but that's how yes. I had discovered, you know. And it was a happy accident because I was looking for statistics, and uh, that, that research was just really pivotal in helping me even shift where, where my direction is going to be going over the next couple of years um, yes. in, in, in some of my academic work. Yeah, and what I love about that work and the work of Entertainment Assist is that, you know, we're real champions for generational change, not just um, overlaying fix-it programs. So we're very concerned, you know, where industry workers are educated to be aware of their own mental health and well-being, and th where they're also educated to support their peers around mental health as well. Um, really encouraging industry employers to actively support the mental health and well-being of employees and that means you know creating much better environments that support how people are feeling um, getting them you know on pathways um, to seek professional assistance and uh, and also we get involved with a lot of the students who are coming into the entertainment industry through universities like Monash and Swinburne that have very good um, creative programs so that they're it's like those support circles I was talking about before. They've already got the tools in their in their kit. Should things change or become challenging, they kind of have an idea of what to do. Yeah, that's look. That's it's a it's a great project. I'm I'm looking forward you know, to to being part of that intermission. Yes, um, it's it, it's really meaningful work. Um, yeah, and I commend you and everyone involved with the entertainment assist for you know the the, the work that's been done um, on that. Mm. It was interesting, actually, Darren, a few years ago when I was first having discussions with Entertainment Assist um, and I mentioned to the chairman, David Mann, who was also a friend of this program and very well known through his work at Radio 3AW, and, uh, and I said, I don't really have much... Well, I'm not, a, I'm not an entertainer, so that means, you know, I probably lack a bit of experience in being able to empathise. He said... Well, you're sitting here on radio, so that makes you an entertainer. <laughs> oh, I never saw it like that. <laughs> yeah, so that it's funny, Dad. Yeah, I know, I know. But we've got a few more minutes uh, left of the show, and I really did want to ask you, and I know Mark Mark has sent another message through, I know, um, with another shout-out, and he said... Uh, Ray Bonnie, I've really enjoyed today's program. Darren is an inspiration and his story is incredible. Thank you for sharing. It's resonated with me. So that's from Mark. Hey, look, yeah, Mark, Mark, thank you. And, for, and for, for, look, for anyone else. And, and the thing that I appreciate is the fact that, look, I, I love being able to, to, you know, to tell my story. But um, And Ray, I'm sure would agree, is the fact that it's, I, I'm, you know, I, we, we all have a story. Um, and I, and I know for a fact, if I was to get to know you, um, that I would be equally as impressed. And I guess I would encourage uh, you, 
Ray has given out her email and that, look, if, if people are looking for certain resources around, uh, you know, support, um, that, you know, especially if there's any first responders or anything, you know, I'm, I'm happy to point you towards a few uh, other organizations because it is important that we find our peers in whatever, whatever, whatever field we're in is that we find those peers, that tribe, that, that support that, that we know is, is, is supporting us um, through whatever that challenge is. Um, so yeah, you don't, don't sit in isolation. Um, I've done it and it really wasn't beneficial. What's different now? Oh, what's different now? I recognize the sign, so I know right away. So when, when that, if, if my sleep is disturbed, I'm not gonna go, well, actually, it's probably because I had that spicy pizza yesterday. Um, I'm going to acknowledge, no, actually, I had something bubble up, or there was a conversation, or there was a challenge, um, and then I, then I do something about it. Um, you know, I'll go for a walk. You know, I look for that best friend. Um, um, I don't have a dog anymore, so oh. I'll, I'll pet someone else's dog. I know. It's, um, <laughs> hopefully, that'll change soon. Um, but no, it, it's, finding, it's finding an outlet. If, if I'm really stressed, the one thing I hadn't realized is how, how much trauma gets you know, stuck in the body. Yes. I'll go out for a run. So mm-hmm. if I'm feeling really stressed or possibly even, you know, come across an auto accident, which I seem to do frequently, oh. um, you know, in the moment, you know, the adrenaline's fantastic. And I'm sure Mark will find any, any, anyone that's ever been in these situations, you know, the adrenaline's fantastic, but it, it'll tear the body down. So I'll go for a run to kind of flush that chemistry out of my body. Mm. I like it how you describe it as chemistry because that's exactly what it is. Mm. And that's all it is. Yeah. And it's, it's similar. There's a lot of drugs, but. <laughs> <laughs> but the opposite of, you know, flushing out that chemistry that, you know, emerges those um, signs and symptoms is the medicine that you take to alleviate it. And, you know, I remember speaking to a guy called Mel Myers here on, on air a few years ago, and he's a chef who does a lot of work in the mental health space. And his medicine is going out into the backyard with a bunch of clay, and he makes ceramics just sitting there in the mud. Beautiful. <laughs> Never Beautiful. sells them. Um, does does no. nothing with them, no. but th- that's his medicine. That's his, and we call that personal medicine. And uh, yeah, that's, and, a, and a lot of my work is I try try to pe- help people find that that personal medicine that they can actually self dispense because we're going to yes. self medicate anyway. This is what alcohol and all of the other distractions that we that we, we turn to is, is, is a way of self-medicating, as you very well know. Um, but it's me finding ways that, yes, if it's making mud pots that you know, never make it to the, to the, to the market, for, that, that's fine. Mm. We, we all have that internal medicine within us, whether it's through doing something or through you know, a, a run, we'll, you know, maybe a, a lovely hug with somebody, yes. again, keeping, keeping COVID, keeping social distancing in mind when it is appropriate to yes. get a hug from, uh, especially when it's a hug from someone you like. Um, <laughs> You know, all of you lovely. You know, not, not that creepy. Yeah, mm. not the creepy uncle. We won't, no, you know, no. not the creepy uncle has the, uh, But it's not, look, somebody that you, you really care about. That when you get yeah. that, you know, those lovely endorphins and all those lovely drugs. That, that well, we do, have you, do you know DNA. today, I, um, my middle son, George, he's moving next week to the Blue Mountains, which is a very lovely place nice. to be, and mm, taking nice. up a project at um, One and Only, which is an f- amazing resort that's owned by Emirates. So he's going to be heading up all the... Um, the um, sustainable food piece in that, being a chef, so it's pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, but this morning he was off off to work. He's working in at Canning's Butchers at the moment during COVID, which is which is great. He's learning all of these butchery <laughs> skills. But um, you know, George is big, you know, six foot three fella, and um, you know, we're we're a pretty pretty close family. But I was up sort of writing the show, and it's about seven o'clock, and he just gave me a really big <laughs> hug and. Um, and it felt exactly like medicine because it's really, um, it's really uh, just inspired me for the day and it's sort of really resonant and quite often we don't know the impact that we have on others and uh, it's the little things that you do, that l- little look, that little text, um, you have no idea what that will mean to somebody so you don't hold back when it comes to giving. Please don't, yeah. I, I know it can, it can be challenging at times and when we don't know, you know, what... Yeah, those little things make such a difference. Yes. And um, often, you know, you don't know how people feel, and especially when we're working with, you know, and that's why I love working with actors because they're even more challenging because they know how to put on that mask yeah. of, yeah, I'm okay. Um, mm. So, you know, trying to get behind that and get, you know, just that, that little thing can make somebody that maybe even appears well um, really get them through something that we're not even aware of. That's right. Now, 
Uh, we're coming up to the end of the show. In fact, we'll probably run over a bit. Uh, I've just seen the divine Paula Hogg walk into the studio. She's up next, rolling out an entire lazy Sunday afternoon of music and banter bound to get you pretty relaxed. If we got you amped up, that'll bring you down. Um, but Darren, thank you from the bottom of my heart being on the show today and being so open in sharing your experiences and also for the, the work that you do um, you know, helping one person at a time. It's, um, it's priceless. Thank you. It, it's, been, it's been an honor to be here and uh, to, you know, always uh, lovely to, to have a chat with you. Um, and, and I appreciate the, the listeners' time as well. Great. Now, um, our final song, special guest song request, is an Eric Clapton song. Absolutely. So, we'll, 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 I guess it's, it's fitting to, 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 to you know the world that we live in, and we uh, I've tried to change it um, from a Washington perspective in a big level, and it's taken me many years. I'm a slow learner. That it, it is just that 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 small thing that we do yeah. is um, that's the only way. So we were talking about compassion today. So yes, um, f- finding our own little ways to change the world, one person at a time, one hug at a time, one smile at a time. So thanks. Thank you. Change the world. <laughs> well, I'll be back um, on Sunday, the 9th of August, speaking with another fascinating guest uh, and talking about what it feels like being them. So remember that it really is okay to not be okay and just ask that question sometime today. What does it feel like being you today? See you later. <laughs>